Uh, it's always a great pleasure to begin the worship service with a baptism. As Anthony said, it's always a great time to start worship by seeing the waters troubled. We're about to bear witness to one of the greatest testimonies to Jesus' salvation in an individual's life. Today, to come share her testimony through believer's baptism is Abby Crimmon. If y'all haven't met Abby, just stand right there. <laughs> If you haven't met Abby, she's a wonderful individual. She's been coming and hanging out with the youth for a little over a year now. Her mom and dad have participated throughout church. Mom even helped uh, with us in times of transition, and it's been a great family. And although she didn't come to faith in this church, she did, through the efforts of this church, realize it was her time to answer God's call to come forth in believer's baptism. And so, Abby, I have a question. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> what is your public profession of faith? Lord is God. I mean, hold on. Jesus. Jesus is Lord. So based on your public profession of faith, Abby, I baptize, my, baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in His likeness, raised to walk in the of life. Baptism does not save us, but it does give us an outward picture of an inward reality. And it's a testimony that everyone needs to hear. We have been in the midst of a Who's Your One campaign uh, where we have been praying for someone who we feel like uh, needs to hear the gospel message, someone who's lost. One individual focusing our prayer on uh, hopefully you've had an opportunity to begin to talk with them and share with them, but we are still in that campaign, uh, and I pray that you've been keeping, us, uh, keeping it in the forefront of your mind. Um, and as a reminder of this today through baptism of how precious the gift that Christ gave us and that we need to share that gift with others, we're going to take this opportunity. And if you would like to join me at the altar this morning as we pray for our one, you come right now and let us pray together. Creator of the universe, our sovereign King Jesus, we come before you today humbly. Lord, we bring our one before you today, the one that we've been praying for. Father, I pray for Mike right now. I pray for his soul. I pray, God, that you will prepare his heart, that you will give me the words to share with him. Father, in just a few short days, I will see him. And I pray, God, that I, I can share the message with him, that I can share with him who Christ is and why it's so important that he receives Christ. And Father, we pray for everyone's one. Father, as we lift their names before you today, we know the urgency of the salvation message. We know the urgency of their punishment. And we pray, God, that you will just help us to have an opportunity to share with them, that you will prepare their hearts to hear the message of the gospel, that you will give us the words to say, the opportunity to say them, and the courage to do so with boldness. In a non-judgmental but extremely loving way, that we can share with them the hope of life. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you died as our substitute. 
And Father, this morning, as we pray for our ones, if there's anyone here today that is lost, that has never surrendered their life to Christ, maybe it is they're at the end of their rope today. They don't know what to do. They feel so lost. Father, it's because they are. And there's no hope for the lost except you. So Jesus, we pray, God, that you will convict, lead us to repentance and save. Now, Father, for those of us that are here that are believers, Father, many times we need to repent for not sharing our faith, for not seeking to multiply ourselves, for not being the missionaries and message bearers that you've called us to be. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you've saved us. Now help us, Lord, to share the gospel of those who are lost. Father, we submit these names to you. And we submit ourselves to you to share with these names we've mentioned. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We, uh, speaking of Lottie Moon International Missions Offerings, uh, oh, hi, guys. <laughs> they snuck up on me. Uh, we have one of our international missionaries here today. I don't know if it's okay, but uh, Abby is back with us. Abby. <laughs> We've been praying for her, and we're thankful that she's here with us today and the work that she's doing uh, in her area of expertise. All right. Uh, we're excited to have the youth lead worship today. Are y'all ready? Please right. stand and put your hands together.
guess what? It doesn't matter what the world says about you. It doesn't matter what I say about you. It doesn't matter what a news column says about you. If you're a child of the king, you're a child because he says you are. And I love that song so much because it defines that our worth is not in the things that we do on this earth. It's not in, in who we think we are. It's not in who the world thinks we are. Our worth is defined by Christ and Christ alone. And that's the beauty of that song, and I appreciate y'all bringing that to us this morning. If you're our guest today, we especially want to welcome you, and we'd like for you to fill out a yellow connection card that's in the pew back. Um, you can either drop it in the offering plate in just a moment, but I don't think that's long enough for you to fill out the card. Plus, if you would like to bring it to the welcome desk on the left-hand side of the stairs after worship today, uh, we would like to give you a coffee mug that says East Newton Baptist Church for you to take with you uh, and uh, as our gift to you. So we want a record of your attendance uh, if you're our first-time guest or first time in a long while. Um, and uh, I just want to say welcome to everybody. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? All right. Well, let's stand and let's fellowship one with another. Father, Lord, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts, thanking you for what you've done for each one of us, and what you've done for East Noonan Baptist Church, and we look forward and we praise you for the many blessings that you will bestow upon us in 2020. Lord, help us to be a light, 
Help us to be the disciples that you've called us to be. As we take up this offering, I pray you'll use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. pray together. Father God, we come before you today and we are thankful, Lord, to be gathered together in your house. Father, for this first Sunday of 2020, we pray, God, that you will help that to be our prayer. We want more of what you have to offer. And Father, the Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 1 that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that you have already poured out that blessing upon us. But Father, many times in our own lives, we, we ration that blessing in our own lives by being involved in sin, by being focused on ourselves, by not doing all the things that you've called us to do. And so Father, we want more of that blessing today. Father, we want to move out of the way more so we can receive that blessing. And Father, we just want to honor you in all that we say this morning, in all that we do in our lives, in the way that we talk, the way that we walk. 
Father, in the way that we share Christ with others, we pray, God, that you will help us to be a blessing to all that we see and all that we do. Father, we love you and we thank you. Pray that you be with us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now that we've been through this worship time together, uh, the title of my sermon is called Set Apart by God. But I could have titled it, I Am a Child of God. In fact, probably would have had a little more impact after we just sang that song or heard our young people sing that song. What a great privilege and blessing salvation brings to those who believe. We have been looking at 1 Peter over the course of the last several weeks leading up to the Christmas time, and we have focused on the blessings and the privilege and the joy that comes from our salvation. We have, as we've looked at the text, we've seen the great joy and the great blessing and the great privilege that God brings us through our inclusion in the kingdom of God. Aren't you glad you're a part of the family of God? Do we truly realize this day how blessed we are? Do we really truly understand what it means to be a child of God? Do we fully grasp the great privilege it is to be a part of the kingdom of God, that the great blessing and love that God lavished on us in our salvation? Do we understand that with great privilege, there is also great responsibility that comes to us as a result of our citizenship in heaven? By the way, you know we're just passing through this world. Our citizenship belongs to heaven. But do you realize there's a great responsibility that we have been given while we're here on this earth? That we are to live out as a citizen of heaven. In our study, Peter has made it pretty clear so far. But in case you missed it, and in case you ate too much turkey over Christmas and slept and forgot all that we talked about, let me just take a minute to remind you of some of the things we've talked about. Our text up to this point has been pretty clear about the blessing and privilege of salvation, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ and what it means to us, and how as a result we are called to a holy life. And our text today offers a summary of everything we've said up until this point. Now, next week we'll begin to turn the corner a little bit from some of the sweeping doctrinal things that Peter is saying to us about our salvation to more practical daily living stuff about how we should live as a result of our salvation, but today he offers a summary of everything we've said so far. And he takes a moment in his letter to just clarify, okay, so this is what I've said, and then we'll move on. Just so you understand, we as people need repetition, don't we? And we need a little bit of review. And we need to be reminded. So as we enter back into this sermon series after taking a couple of weeks off, I think it's a good place to start. A summary of everything he said. Kind of a, a, a bringing it all together, if you will, of what he was talking about up until this point. So what does it mean that we are saved? What, what meaning does that have in our lives? Do we truly understand it? Do we understand what it means to be set apart by God? Do we understand what it means that we are a child of God? Turn with me in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, and let's stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. He says this, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people of God, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, 
but now you have received mercy. Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I've got good news for you. Peter only gives us two main points in this passage today, instead of the usual three or four. But they are important points. First, he explains how, based on basically a review of what he said so far, how we've been set apart as God's special possession as his children. And then he defines what our primary purpose is again. So let us look first at the setting apart of God's people. The setting apart of God's people. He says several things about uh, God's people. Let, let me just read those again. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people of God, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So he says several things about our setting apart, several things about our salvation. First he says, you are a chosen race, a chosen race. Now, Peter here is underscoring the eternal destinies of two groups of people. There are people who are God's chosen people, his chosen race, his family, his kingdom, his church, those who believe. And there are those who do not believe, those who are not a part of the family, those who are not part of the chosen race. They are unbelievers. And while one is appointed to eternal glory to be lived out in the presence of God Almighty for eternity, the other is appointed to eternal doom, eternal anguish, to be lived out separated from God for all eternity. eternity. Two destinies. One to glory, one to doom. One to the praise of his glory, one to his wrath poured out for all generations. It harkens back to the Old Testament when he says, you are a chosen race. Understand, Peter is talking about the church here. He's not talking just to the Jews. He's talking to the church, and he says, you, church, are a chosen race. And so he's hearkening back to the chosen people of God, Israel, in the Old Testament. That God chose a people out of all the nations of the earth to accomplish his plan and his glory. And as he told Abraham in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his seed, through his nation, Israel. And that blessing, we know, is none other than the person of Jesus Christ who has come to save the world. Every tribe and every tongue, there will be people who believe. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 7, please. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. It says this. I still hear your pages turning, so I'll wait. I can't hear your apps moving if you're using a phone, though. I like the rustling sound better. For you are a people holy to the Lord, your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, but for you are the fewest of all peoples. So God set his love on the people of Israel before there were even a people. <laughs> He set his love on the people of Israel before Abraham ever had a child. He set his love on the people of Israel to bless all the nations of the earth, not because of anything they had done or anything they would do, but because God is God. And he set his love on them, 
And we've already seen a series, uh, a sermon in this series devoted to how God elects his people to his kingdom and puts his choice on people and sets his love on people. But for our purposes today, what we'll simply note here is that when he says you're a chosen race, what he's saying there is salvation is God's work, not ours. Did y'all hear me? Salvation is not about you, and it's not accomplished through you. Salvation is about God and God alone. Salvation is, a, is initiated by God. He sent Jesus. He, he, before the foundation of the world, he sent Jesus to be our sacrifice. So it's God's purpose. And we are part of that chosen race that God has brought together to bless all the nations of the earth. He next says, not only are we a chosen race, we are a royal priesthood. The nation of Israel was given the privilege of being a royal priesthood, but because of their rebellion, they forfeited that right. Now, what is it to be a priest? Now, we've talked about this in the course of some sermons over the last couple of years, um, or year and whatever. Uh, a priest is a person that speaks to the people on behalf of God. So they... Uh, speaks to God on behalf of the people. A prophet is a person that speaks to the people on behalf of God. So they're the mouthpiece of God. A priest is an intercessory, uh, someone that speaks to God on behalf of the people. Well, well, God has made us a nation of royal priests because the nation of Israel forfeited their right because they didn't do what God had told them to do. And now he's calling us to do what he's told them to do. What does it mean that we are a royal priesthood? It means that we're to mirror God's glory among the nations. Now, here's the thing. People don't need a priest to get to God anymore. We believe, as Baptists, in the priesthood of the believer. Now, what that means is that we have access to God. Not that all of us are as smart as a theologian or we know everything there is to know about the Bible. That's what some people want to say priesthood of the believer means. Uh, if you believe that, then you're missing the point. Because there's none of us who have arrived doctrinally, spiritually, and theologically. So we're all still working on that. But the idea of a priesthood, they no longer need a priest to get to God, but they do need someone to act as an intercessory between them and God to bring about the salvation message, to share with them what salvation is and to mirror God's glory. So it means that we are to have direct access to God through our priesthood, and as those royal priests, we're to mediate the blessing of God to the people uh, through, uh, through sharing the message of the gospel, through living like Christ, through showing the world that our lives are different, not because we're more special than anybody, but because we've been changed by God. Do you, by the way, do you still believe that? Do you still believe that someone who is a Christian should look different than the rest of the world? Why are all these churches trying to look like the world? We should look different. We should be appealing to, to lost people simply because we have something they don't have. We've been saved. We ought to look like what the Bible says we ought to look like. So we shouldn't have to conform to the world. That's, that's a whole other sermon, and it's not in my notes, so I'm just going to move on, okay? We're a holy nation, thirdly. Looking back at the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was set apart for God, uh, by God for his purposes. But they forfeited the right by sin and rebellion, by continually going after other gods, by living in ways that were contrary to God's way. And the chosen race in the New Testament was to become a holy nation, that is a set apart nation. Holy is a word that means set apart. So that's what that word means. We are set apart. We are to, to look holy. We are to look like God. And so a holy nation is a group of people that are chosen by God that, that are set apart. So as we're set apart individually, and we saw a beautiful picture of what salvation is all about in the baptistry this morning, we, we have been changed. We identify with Christ. We're totally different. We're a new creature. All right, so we've been set apart as individuals, and those people who have been set apart as individuals gather together and do the work of God together. That's why the church is so important. 
I don't need to belong to a church or be a part of a church to be saved. Well, that's the group of people that God has chosen to be a blessing to this world. So you better be. You better be involved. A holy nation is set apart, and it's for the purpose, and we've talked about this, holiness. We're called to a holy life. That's what this sermon series, that's what the title is. We're set apart to be holy. We're set apart to be holy as individuals. We're set apart to be holy as a group. Earlier in the letter, Peter urges his believers, uh, the believers to be holy. And so there is this cooperation that must take place in our lives as we work with the Holy Spirit and what he is doing in our lives to become more holy like God is holy. As such, we're a holy nation. Speaking of that, I, I, I recently started reading, and I mean by recently, yesterday, <laughs> a, a new book by Tom Rainer, and I can't even remember the name of it now. It's so new. I've only read like 10 pages in it. But what he's dealing with in there is you know, he wrote The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Has anybody ever read that little book? A few people. Well, this book is, is uh, one that uh, talks about the things that churches have done to keep from being a dead church, and that is literally closing the door. And in that book, he talks about not being focused on ourselves. You know the best way to kill a church? Make it about what you want. That's not my notes, man. I can't go ahead. <laughs> the point is, we're a holy nation set apart as holy people for God's purposes and not ours. And the quicker we learn it's not about us, the fuller this church will be every week because we'll be loving people like God has called us to love instead of more concerned about what we want when we come to church. I always wanted reclining pews. Have you ever thought? <laughs> that way those that were sleeping wouldn't feel so bad about it. <laughs> I hadn't really wanted that. That was just a joke. All right. So we're not only a holy nation, we're God's possession now. <laughs> Listen to this. God's special possession, his treasured possession. And you heard me read in Deuteronomy how the people of Israel were God's special possession. And now Peter's saying the church is God's special possession. What does it mean that we're his special possession? It means that he was willing to pay any price to secure our salvation. He was willing to send his son, Christ Jesus. Look back at the chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 in 1 Peter. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. God was willing to own us as his special possession to pay the ultimate price of sending his son Jesus to die as our substitute. My friend, we were so worthy as God's special let me take that back. We were so unworthy to receive this blessing, but God considered us so worthy that he was willing to die for us. Do you understand what that means? We are God's special possession. Why don't we live for him? Why do we ever get to a place in our lives where we say, you know, I just, I, I really need to buckle down and serve the Lord. But we do. All of us get to that position. God has saved us. Titus 2.14 says, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. You hear that last part? Listen, I, I don't want to get real negative right here, but let's just do it for a second, okay? I want you to think about the worst sin you ever committed. And I want you to stand up and tell us, no, I'm, <laughs> no. Think about the worst sin you ever committed. Jesus died for that sin. Amen. And he died for that sin to make you his special possession. And he takes that sin, the Bible says, and cast it as far as the east is from, which way is East. That way, maybe? That way? Anyway, yeah. 
Uh, he cast it west, so as far as east is from the west. Anyway, you get the point. It's a long way. And he has overcome that sin in our lives to make us his special possession. And look what Titus says, that we become zealous for good deeds. Now, everybody's going to pull out their compass on their phones and try to figure out where east is. Y'all meet me here at sunrise in the morning. We'll figure it out. I'm, I won't be here. All right. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and he did it to make us a special possession. Amen. We're called out, he says. What it means to be set apart, we're God's special possession, and we're called out. The, unbeliever, uh, the unbelieving world faces two types of darkness. Did you know that? They face intellectual darkness. They don't understand the things of God. They don't understand spiritual things because the Bible says in Corinthians that these things are spiritually appraised. The natural man cannot understand those things. And so we're in intellectual darkness. And so the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Right? That's what the Bible says. That lost people just simply do not understand these things because they're in intellectual darkness. They're blinded. But also they're in moral darkness. They don't understand what is right and wrong, or they don't care what is right and wrong, and they don't feel guilty about the things that they do that are against God. Moral, intellectual darkness is the inability to know right from wrong and understand the things of God. Moral darkness is the inability to do that which is right. You say, well, lost people do good things all the time, but my friend, let me ask you, what's their motive? Do they give a lot of money to charity for a tax write-off? That's a selfish motive. That's not for God's glory. I often use the illustration, how can the Boy Scout help a little old lady across the street and commit sin? If he does it not for the benefit of the lady, but to get that merit badge. When, when it's about us, it's prideful and sinful. But when it's about God and about others, that's moral morally right in fact jesus taught that men love being in their moral and intellectual darkness he says in first john chapter 3 verse 19 and 20 this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed but god calls the the believer, out of moral and intellectual darkness and into his kingdom of marvelous light. Out of the muck and the mire and the confusion and the misunderstanding and the sin and the pride and the rebellion and the hatefulness and the mean-spiritedness and all those things God calls us out of and picks us up and puts us in the kingdom of light where we desire to do that which is right, where we desire to do good towards others, where we want to share the gospel with others, and that's something that we must cultivate. But God illuminates our minds so that we understand right from wrong, and he activates our souls so that we, for the first time in our lives, can truly obey that which is morally right. God does a work in us that calls us out of darkness and into light. And then he says, we're a people of mercy. Once we were not God's people, and now we are God's people. Once we were not a people of mercy, but now we are a people of mercy. Listen, I praise the Lord that once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was hostile toward the things of God, but now I'm a friend of God. In our sin and in our rebellion, God made a way. He made a way for us to be called out and set apart as a people of mercy for himself. And he did so because of his great mercy, which he lavished on us. For God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to read one more passage to you, and I'd like for you just not to turn there. I'd like for you just to listen, if you will. And I believe I read it a couple of weeks ago up to this point, but didn't finish reading 
this particular text. And but I'm be reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were once dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were without hope, and God sent hope. We were without peace, and God sent peace. We were without righteousness and goodness, and God sent he who is righteousness. And because of his great mercy, which he lavished on us, he saved us and brought us into his kingdom. And he has rescued us from judgment and grants us an unbelievable inheritance. If we look back at Ephesians chapter 1, it says he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I want more of God. He's already given you everything. Why don't you just take it? Why don't you just receive it? Why don't you just get out of the way so he can bless you? We are a race chosen by God, called out of darkness into light, set apart as a holy nation to become a royal priesthood through his great mercy, the mercy of God to become a people, a special possession bought with the infinitely expensive pride price of the blood of the spotless lamb of God. But here's the question, what's the purpose of all that? If God has called us out, there must be a purpose, there must be a reason. Look at what he says. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Here it is, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We have been saved to be a blessing to others. We've been blessed to be a blessing to others. We must proclaim the excellencies of God. What is the purpose of our called out state? The church is established to bring glory to God. Our worship this morning was to bring glory to God. It wasn't about us. We were singing to him. Well, I didn't know some of those songs, and I didn't like them too much. Well, again, I say it again. We weren't singing to you. We were singing to God. That's, that's why we gather here. It's to bring glory to God. That's the only reason we gather. Why do we have Sunday school and Bible studies? So that we can grow in Christ and our lives can bring glory to God. Those Sunday school classes, they're, they're for Him, not for you. You benefit from them. You get blessed by them. It's great that we grow in Christ, and it's great that we receive those blessings that impact all the people around us. If we're, if we're growing in Christ, we're certainly a better father, a better mother, a better child, or a better grandparent, or a better Sunday school teacher, or a better deacon, or a better, you name it. Wednesday night, when, when does that start back? I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> Wednesday night cooks, whatever you do, you can do it better if you grow in Christ and you get the benefits from that, but your growth is about bringing glory to God. That's what it's all about. We are to proclaim the excellencies of him who set us apart. 
It's about sharing Christ with those who are lost. It's about loving those who are lost. It's about praying for those who are lost. It's about being a blessing to those who are hurting. It's about lifting up those who are downtrodden. It's about us being a blessing to others because we've been blessed by God. And sometimes, sometimes we get to receive the blessing. Amen? Sometimes we're the ones that's sick in the hospital and people bring us food. Thank y'all for that, by the way. Sometimes it's us that, that gets prayed for. But most times, it's us being a blessing to others, right? And that's the beauty of it. When we spread our sorrows out among other people, they can help us bear that burden, amen? And when we share the excellencies of the glory of God, it makes every situation better. Do you understand that you've been called out? Do you understand that you've been called as a royal priest in the kingdom of God? Do you know that you know that God has called you out? Listen, we can never increase the worth of God. Okay, God is already worthy. He's already glorious. We can never increase that. But we can magnify it to other people. We can take a magnifying glass of our lives and show God through that. But our lives are to be an act of God to the nations. To tune people in to God's glory. Once, as an experiment, the great scientist Sir Isaac Newton stared at the image of the sun reflected in a mirror. Now, he was a pretty smart guy, but that doesn't seem too smart to me. The brightness of the sun burned into his retina, and he suffered temporary blindness as a result. Even after he hid for three days in a dark room in his house behind closed shutters, still that bright spot would not fade from his vision. He still could see the image of the sun, even in complete darkness. He said this, I used all means to divert my imagination from the sun. But if I thought upon him, I presently saw his picture, though I was in the dark. And he said, if I'd have stared a minute or two longer, I may have lost my vision permanently. The chemical receptors that govern eyesight cannot stand the full force of looking directly at the sun. When the believer is called out of darkness and into light, God sets them apart. And we, likewise, experience the magnitude of his glory. And it burns within us an image that stays with us. The glory of God in us and through us. Why is it, though, that sometimes that excitement about our salvation fades why is it that we sometimes get distracted? If we are chosen by God specifically for the purpose of being a, 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 the glory of God to the nations, to proclaim the excellencies of God to the nation, why don't we do it? Why don't we share? It's because we let our world, our suffering, our Difficulties, our talents, our hobbies, our lives, our sin, our children. All these things get in the way of our walk with God. Because we make them more important than God, see. We idolize them. My prayer for you this morning is two things. Number one, if you have never surrendered your life to Christ, if you remain in darkness today, I call on you to be saved so that you can be a part of this special possession of God and proclaim the excellencies and glory of God. The Bible says that we're all sinners. We're all desperately in need of salvation. But God, who is rich in mercy and love, sent his son Jesus to die in our place. The Bible says the key to salvation is faith. We must believe in Jesus Christ. Believe that he died in our place and accept his death on the cross. 
But we also must repent, that is, turn away from our sin, as if to never commit it any longer. That is repentance. And if we repent and believe, then the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Secondly, if you're here this morning, and you are a believer, I call upon you this day to recognize your set-apartness. The glory of our salvation and the purpose of it. God has called you out of the darkness and into the light to be the light. You hear me? God has called us out of the darkness and into light to be the light. So my challenge to you, believer, today is be the light. Be the light. Will you share your faith with someone in 2020? Will you share your faith with someone in January? Oh, will you share your faith with someone this week? That's what God has called us to. Listen, if every believer here today would share their faith with someone in January, someone would be saved. And maybe many someone. We can't control the outcome, but we're just called to share the message, right? Amen? We're called to share the glory. So, God has called us out of darkness into light to be the light, so be the light. God has called you out of darkness and into light. If you're not in the light, come to the light. Father, we come before you today. Grateful for every word of the Bible that speaks to us about our situation, our lost state, and your salvation that you bring to us. Father, this morning... We pray if there's someone here today that's lost, that you will save them. That you will do a work in their heart and lives. And Father, if there's believers here today that just need to refocus on what it is you've called us to do. To share and proclaim the excellencies of the great glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you will help us to repent of our unfocused attention to you and that you will help us to get back to being who you've called us to be Father we love you do your work today in the name of Jesus we pray Amen. stand with us this is a time of invitation you come as we sing, if you need to be saved, I'll be glad to talk with you. If you need to come to this altar, you come and pray. If you need to repent of not making Jesus first, you do it right now.
Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Just remember that as you leave this place today. We'd like to thank our youth for leading worship today. You can go ahead. And we just like to praise the Lord that he's called us out of darkness and into the light. So, be the light. Say it with me. Say it. Be the light. All right. Uh, Father, bless us now as we go from this place. Help us to be the light in the mission field of the world. Father, we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.